subjects? And I think it's a really important question because he raised a, he, I mean, he raised he raised a really fundamental question about what we're trying to do with social media. Which to me, the only interesting discussion worth having is can we use it to build a revolutionary organisation? And therefore, the figure of the kind of communist correspondent I think is really important because we're not really talking about armies of citizen journalists that we want. There are armies of citizen journalists. We want armies of revolutionary socialist journalists. And we want them to be able to do what Hossam said, which is actually that they themselves, independently of being told by people on the Central Committee or from the paper or whatever, will actually come out with the right line, with the right politics, will know what to do in the right situation, will be leaders in the class without knowing to having to go on Twitter. Now, there isn't... The, how do you get to that situation? How do you manage to produce that generation of people? Yes, you have to engage with the tools that are there. I think you absolutely have to have your own publication where you have that, that relationship with form and content that, uh, that, Mark, that Mark talked about. But the purpose of this is to produce people who will say and do the right things. What, what was really striking about the Bolsheviks was that even when the central spine of organisation and the central paper um, didn't exist, that they came out with the right things. The same line was argued in the leaflet that the Bolsheviks had put into a factory in Kazan as it would be in St. Petersburg. In order to get to that, they had to have the all-Russian newspaper. They had to have that central tradition. They had to create a tradition. They had to have those human discussions, those human face-to-face uh, uh, -face <coughs> debates and arguments, and there was a to and fro. But that really is the goal, I think, that we're looking for, is creating a generation of people who can do that. And I think we have, in the language, of and in the spaces that people are having these discussions now, that includes being online, that includes all of the all of these places we've been talking about. That's to me the importance of discussion. But the goal is exactly where Hossam ended the meeting, I think, ended his contribution in the meeting. The issue of what Nick Davis talks about as journalism, the way in which cuts and attacks on jobs and conditions lead to uh, these kinds of shortcuts. Uh, there's also, of course, the way in which uh, uh, a lot of journalists look towards people like Hossam as key indicators <laughs> of, of very important demographics within uh, different, uh, different communities and different, uh, and different movements. What we can see, I think, there is that when, when we say that we're at the, the mercy of the mainstream press, this points to, a, a, to, to one thing which is clear, which is that we need to build a very strong, independent, revolutionary press. And I think that one of the inspirational things that you see, actually, uh, coming out of the Arab Revolution is those videos of, the, of members of the RS selling their paper hand over fist um, in Tahrir Square. Um, but of course, it's, uh, the revolutionary press isn't just limited to papers. It's also about what is the revolutionary press doing online, when we can use videos, when we can use social media and all of these other things. I, I want to talk quickly about another aspect, which I think is very important. If we look at the, uh, the recent workfare protest, the protests that happened around workfare, I want to argue that um, could, could they have happened without social media? Well, of course, it, there could have been uh, these protests without social media. But the way that they did happen did involve a huge element of people using social media, not so much to organize them, but in order to uh, get that talk about what's going on, the way that that then connected with uh, The Guardian and then other newspapers picking up on what was happening, and of course also the crucial uh, uh, occupation of Tesco's right next to the House of, the House of, Co the House of, uh, uh, the House of Commons. And the way in which all of these things came together to create, you know, almost a perfect storm. And as Marxists, we analyze, you know, what's actually happened. And I think we have to come to grips with all of these uh, things. The, just quickly, the final thing that I want to say. Um, uh, we can talk a lot of, um, we talked about um, slacktivism briefly. I think this is a really inadequate way to talk about things. When we talk about the internet, we've got to be clear. When people say, oh, slacktivism, this is just so people can think that they're doing something. They're clicking, they're clicking a petition, but they're not really getting involved. People had, uh, you know, umpteen ways of not getting involved long before the internet <laughs> came along. <laughs> but everyone who's been on a protest or a political meeting recently will meet someone who their first experience of getting involved with, with stuff will have been the internet, will have been clicking uh, a petition or whatnot. The crucial question for us then, and I think that this is the same with all elements, are we using the internet to 
control people, to be a passive disseminator of information, or are we using it to try and get people involved in activity? Are we trying to use it to enable people? You know, there's, you, you can look at things that happen online, like petitions and online petitions, and you can see how that's very much a sort of We'll do it for you. That happens in other layers of the labour movement and activism as well. We've got to be the people who are saying that, no, we're not going to do it for you. You have to be involved in making it happen. And just finally, you know, you know the whole thing about will the revolution be televised? The revolution will be tweeted, the revolution will be live streamed, and no one will actually be in their house to watch it on television. <laughs> they'll all be out on the streets with their smartphones. <laughs> Or on the other hand, you get people who are proud. What's this Twitter, Twitter, what is it, you know? And this idea that we're, I'm so proud that I don't touch this stuff. And I think, you know, they're both wrong places. Um, and if we, you know, as revolutionaries, we sort of believe in change, don't we? We believe in things moving on and actually using every possible tool we can. I mean, that absolutely needs to be, needs to be central for us. And I think that some of the interesting things that have come out of the revolutions, and whether it is Egypt or Bahrain or other places, is actually under, in the repressive states, the social media played a special role for people that couldn't connect because of the repression. That couldn't physically have meetings publicly and meet in the street and sell their paper openly. It's played a special role where they were forced, if you like, to use something. And actually, the fact that you can see um, uh, revolutionary socialists selling the paper in uh, the streets of Cairo and Alexandria because is a gain of the revolution. And actually, to see them standing there, you know, when we went back there and seeing people sign up and give their names and addresses in the street to strangers selling a revolutionary socialist paper. That's a gain of the revolution because actually it's not that just, oh, we've chosen to use the paper now. It's like they can do this now. They can connect to real people because people aren't frightened to give their name and address to a revolutionary in the street in Cairo. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a wonderful sight and absolutely, you know, made, made, made me cheer sort of thing. But I think that the, the sense of what we want to do, you know, is not just to be an efficient disseminator of information. You know, that's not solely what we want to do. We do. Bus strike on, get out tomorrow. You want that out to everybody fast. But at the same time, we want the people then to go on the picket lines to bring a socialist worker, as editor of socialist worker, I've got an <laughs> interest in promoting this, but you know, that sense of why do we have a physical paper? It's not efficient. It has to get in trains, it has to be in trucks, it has to be taken to Scotland physically. This is not an efficient way to get information across because it's about something else, isn't it? It's about actually having a connection between people. You're this revolutionary, I want to come for you to advise about what we do in our strike and where are you having that meeting? And when you come to this big event in London called Marxism and you can meet all these people, this is different than watching it alone on your, on your, it'll be great to watch Hossan and Mark if somebody can't be here, but actually how much better to be here and be able to take part in the discussion and that, the, the, the working together thing I think absolutely is vital and when you talked about Al Jazeera I thought that was so interesting because of course during the 18 days they shut down the internet, the state can do that, we have to be able to function and yet a million people marched on that Tuesday or wherever it was and that sense of actually things didn't stop but what was interesting about the Al Jazeera thing, everybody, you see I thought that when I was there lots of people were holding up signs in English and in lots of other languages because they wanted the word to get out to the world and because they didn't have the internet they knew it wasn't happening and so in fact it wasn't the same in the year anniversary, everything was in Arabic but during the 18 days and people would recognise, you know, you're a white woman, who are you, tell the world about the revolution, you know, and actually when Al Jazeera went up they hung up sheets from the side of one of the buildings, all sewn together, and put Al Jazeera live onto it. And so you have people standing in Tahrir Square in their hundreds of thousands, watching themselves on <laughs> telly, on a sheet there. So it's slightly sort of bizarre, but it was almost a validation. People know this is happening. This word has gone out there. So that sense of it, it's so important that they were making the revolution, but that actually they knew other people knew about it. I think that was something. And I just thought it would be nice to say something about something low tech. So about Kazaboon, about the idea of taking, if that's how you say it in English, the, the campaign to show footage of what the military did on walls around the cities. And just maybe to tell people about that, because I think that's a wonderful low tech, but a way of actually organizing people with what <laughs> Yeah. She spoke brilliantly about the use of uh, media and as alternative journals and like as well. Um, uh, I wanted to make a point about, I mean, it's very important what Mark and what Christian mentioned about, you know, seeing um, the value of social media or internet, but a form of technology basically in a dialectic uh, prism. And I think that both, both means it's both positive and negative. So, I mean, thank you for mentioning my book. As I write with regards to Palestine, it's a blessing and a curse. And that's the reality that we, in this capitalist system, uh, deal with on an everyday uh, basis anyway, with everything. Why not with technology? You have to make choices based on the circumstances you're in. 
But I think the other uh, importance about making this sort of historical materialist analysis is that also you can't generalize. And I think we also have to be a bit cautious. I think it's very important that we're bending the stick the other way about you know being a bit less uh, pedantic about it and being open to it. But also I think it's important to be aware of the fact that you can't generalize. It really depends on which context you're operating from. And last night we said that the three important conditions we're dealing with. I mean, you're sort of, are you acting, uh, um, dealing with the internet, with technology in the context of high oppression? Well, <laughs> that makes a difference. You can't just say, use social media. Whenever you can, don't be sectarian about it. Well, if it means you can be arrested, then I think the circumstances are, are different. If you're organizing in the context of censorship, of course, then alternative uh, journalism is very important. But if there's relative freedom of speech, then it's not really important to spend 24 hours just, you know, disseminating information. And finally, the context of, of, of neoliberalism and capitalism. You have to be aware of that. I mean, 19 of the 21 um, major internet companies are private-owned companies by multinationals. That means something. That says something. That's something that you need to keep in the back of your mind. The fact that Facebook is archiving all your data for commercial purposes is important. Now, as for my personal experiences with doing fieldwork and, and, uh, and activism in Palestine and Lebanon, there's also a really a shocking um, realization I got this year of the level of naivety of people who go to Palestine, not realizing how the conditions are so different there than what they're used to. It's very common that once you enter the country, the Israelis a demand for you to open your Facebook account and your Google account. So they go through all your data and take you. And people are not aware of the fact that it's being done. So this is another example of why cautious is important. And the final example is the fact that, of course, the internet is also part of soft power. Americans are, have done that for ages in all forms of media, of course, also in internet media. And particularly in the Middle East, I found it really funny. The Americans have this digital outreach program that they go on blogs and, and networks to convince Egyptians and other Arabs to be more pro-American. <laughs> but the positive, the, exactly, the positive point to end with is that, of course, in most cases, it doesn't work because people are a bit more ahead of the soft power of the argument. <laughs> Thank you. tomorrow. Um, also, we've got some pamphlets. If you're interested in reading John Grant's article about this, you can buy it in the ISJ. We've also got an eyewitness account of the Egyptian Revolution, both of which are available at Bookmarks. Finally, you can follow Marxism online on the website marxismbestbuild.org.uk. Um, you can also use the hashtag Marx2012 on Twitter. And finally, for those of you who don't already know, we're really sorry to announce that Antonio Negri will not be able to speak today. Um, he's having minor surgery, but the meeting will be going ahead with Alex and Nicholas. Anyway, Mark, will you let us um, just, just quickly, I think it was a, it, I think it was a really fruitful discussion. And by the way, uh, Marx 2012, the hashtag actually was trending at one point. How <laughs> today? So that's a success for you know our online intervention. Not quite. I think it's better if you know more uh, than um, several more thousand would be here um, throughout the day. What I want you to get back to is, is very quickly is as revolutionary socialists uh, and, and Marxists, we're not deter deterministic in the sense that we, we know what, and we have experience of how big impacts even small, small groups of people, even small groups of workers have made over the last, uh, over the last kind, kind of year, or the st uh, storming of Milbank has made, uh, has made headlines. However, what we need to really come to terms with is, in, that, in those kinds of situations, party organization becomes much more crucial than ever before and having, if you can make a sm very big impact with a small number of people, you just need to imagine what kind of a bigger, even a bigger impact we would have uh, with large, uh, with much larger group of people. And I think that's why Anne's point about how do, how do we build revolutionary organizations and how do we use the technolo technologies disposable to us at this moment in time in order to facilitate that building of organization is really crucial. Whether the, that of key I outlined was the paper and how do we use all the other methods of agitation and propaganda. And just to come, and just to come on a very conclu uh, 
close conclusion is with, the, is with something that Duncan Callis said in terms of mass agitation. And I think that's why ultimately everyone has had the experience of why you set up a Facebook event about like, you know, a reading group on the German ideology I once did, and I had 50 people attending on Facebook and only five people turned up. In the same way, the 11th of February in Egypt is actually a case example, uh, is a case example uh, of, of, why you, of why sometimes agitation doesn't work out. Because and Duncan Hallis writes in his thing on agitation and propaganda, he writes, widespread agitation with general focus is not possible without a significant number of people who suitably placed to carry it without a party. And I'll leave it with that. Join the SOVP, join the debates around the internet, and become a revolutionary. Yeah, I'm just going to address a couple of points uh, raised by the comrades. Um, regarding security concerns, there isn't a recipe, I mean, for this. I mean, it does differ from one context to the other, and even within the same country, it differs from, you know, I mean, one period to the other. I remember, for example, in 2007, I was, uh, I mean, I, I was traveling uh, uh, briefly outside the country, so we were, you know, I met a group of comrades, including some of our veteran labor organizers. We were having, like, a farewell shisha, and everybody was like joking, laughing. And then a veteran textile organizer was, I mean, through this line, he was like, back in the day, if a camera came out in a strike, everybody would either like, cover their faces or, you know, I mean, run away. But now, when a camera comes out, everybody goes out with their bare chests. This was in 2007. And I asked him, why do you think this is the case? His answer was, because they've got nothing to lose. But actually, I think this is not necessarily the correct answer. If, you, if a camera had appeared in Egypt, you know, or any strike, like a few years before 2007, this would have meant that your photo would go in the crime section of any of the state-run uh, newspapers as agitators, uh, rioters, blah, 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 blah. Or these photos will go to state security police directly. Why? We didn't have independent press. And we didn't have alternative media. So, I mean, if a camera comes out, it makes sense. Like, you know, this will go to the authorities. <laughs> Full stop. But starting from 2004, when we started to have a private media, I'm not going to call it independent media, but private newspapers who were interested in selling, you know, so they had to put on, like, some interesting news that people would go and buy the newspaper's issues, you know what I mean, from newspapers like Al-Masri Yom and the others, meant that if your photo was taken in a strike, it could appear on the front page of that in the, uh, private newspaper, you know, with actually favorable coverage. And this started to change the mentality. Even in the night, th there is like a dialectical relationship. You know, your face appears, okay, you get exposed to the security services. But also, I mean, you get exposed to the people, and the people are actually the biggest protection in that case. Why? I mean, even in the 1990s, when our organization was completely underground, we still had like what we call burnt cadres, like you know, I mean, cadres who are known publicly to be revolutionary socialists uh, uh, because they are like involved in public activities. You know, whether it's agitating, you know, I mean, protests or leading student protests or organizing strikes, and they were known. But you know, the protection that me and other burnt cadres had, even when we still got arrested, we got school on occasions, you know, we got detained in the state security cells, etc., etc. But each time we got detained, there was always a reaction. Okay, like if, I, if I'm a student, I get kidnapped, you know, because of my face got exposed and I'm known, you know, if I get kidnapped from my university campus, there will be protests, you know, and there will be pressure in order to release me. Uh, if strikers, like in the 80s, in the railways, even before, you know, I mean, the independent media and everything, who led the railway strikes, okay, and they were detained and tortured by state security police, but they were all acquitted. Why? On their trial day, 30,000 people showed up and besieged the court, and, you know, if they were, like, convicted, they would have stormed it and torched it down. It's as simple as that. So there, is, there isn't, like, a recipe. You know, I mean, whether, like, should you expose your face, should you not? I mean, this is really extremely relative. And you have to know there is nothing that's, like, 100% safe. Or else, you know, you can stay in your bed and you never leave. That's, like, the safest thing. <laughs> Once you take out to the streets, there are risks. You know, and this is part of the risks that, uh, you, that you have to take. Uh, and regarding the campaign that uh, Judith, like, referred to very quickly, we did hold the campaign together with other political forces, but we were central to it. 
called Kazibu Liars. And we started this campaign at the beginning of this year, where basically we would go to neighborhoods, set up, you know, I mean, some screen or even like you know, use some uh, wall of a building, and we would start disseminating, you know, like showing the videos of the abuses of the army against protesters in the Occupy cabinet uh, uh, sitting, the infamous one which the army uh, uh, massacred, uh, and to show other, like, I mean, abuses to counter the propaganda that was being disseminated by the state-run media that, oh, no, I mean, there are just a bunch of thugs in Tahrir, the army didn't do anything, blah, blah, blah. And we were showing this, you know, I mean, everywhere. We were trying, and, and didn't cost anything. I mean, all what you need is just a small projector and a piece of cloth. You know, I mean, basically. But you needed activists on the ground who would go and build those projectors, and they would be there to protect, you know, I mean, the projectors from any uh, attacks by thugs, whether it's by the army or, or the police. And many people started to change uh, their own opinion about what's going on after those very successful campaigns that were picked up uh, very quickly. I will sum up uh, with one point, um, and sorry for uh, taking so much time. My motto is the spread of information is essentially an act of agitation. Okay? If you go to the Mahalla, you know, workers, and tell them, hello, I've just come from uh, Kafr Dawar, and they've just had a strike over one, two, three, four, and they won. Okay, bye-bye, you know, and then you leave. <laughs> I am sure after you leave, they're gonna sit down, well, well, I mean, well, it's the same company, it's just a different branch, and you know, we, we have the same problems. Hell, you know, if they manage to win, then we can also strike and win those demands. Why do you think the Mahalla uh, uh, initial strike in December 2006 triggered all of those strikes? I mean, how did those strikes, I mean, the domino effect work? I did not enter a single factory in 2007 without hearing, you know, that from the strikers, we saw the Mahalla workers, you know, I mean, winning, so we decided to move along. We heard that the Mahalla workers had won, so we decided to start our strike. We read that the Mahalla, you know, the Mahalla strike won, so we decided to do that. Just sometimes by spreading information, about real industrial actions and acts of resistance on the ground, as simple as that, it can actually trigger the domino effect. I mean, when people talk about, oh, Tunisia inspired Egypt, I mean, how did it inspire us? We were watching it live on Al Jazeera. We were seeing things that they were doing that basically inspired us. We need to visualize dissent, comrades. We need to visualize dissent. I can spend hours and hours and hours explaining, you know, what the Mahalla workers are all about or what they are doing, or I can show you a slideshow, you know what I mean, basically. That would be much more powerful. And again, I think if Lenin and John Reed were alive, they would have been one head of bloggers. <laughs> <laughs>